I invite you to turn to uh, the Gospel according to Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 14 to be specific. We're going to continue our, our series, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, distinguishing Jesus, the biblical Jesus, from the other Jesuses that are out there in the world of false Jesuses, uh, the Jesuses that cannot save you. Um, Jesus of Nazareth is the only Jesus that can save us from um, our, our sins. And we're getting deep into, into Matthew, and so we're getting a little familiar with how Matthew goes about uh, his structuring of things. Um, he doesn't isolate very often, isolate stories. He tends to put stories together, which is challenging for a pastor because when we start taking apart the story, we start losing the bigger picture of what he's trying to say. Chapter 14 is a perfect example of this. There's there's four stories we're going to be looking at, and you can have a sermon on all four of those. In fact, you can have a whole series on all four of those. Um, they're big stories, but if you look closely as we read through this, Matthew links these all together. They're in a, a, a certain amount of, of time, and he links them all together because he wants to show you something. And this something is, is about faith, and it's about the developing faith of the disciples, and particularly Peter. He's going to start singling out Peter and say, you want to look at faith, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Look at Peter. Like, why Peter? Well, Peter's one of the leaders within the church who takes faith to its ultimate heights, as we're going to see this morning in a few moments. And he's also the one that crashes faith all the way to its lowest bottom, right? Jesus calls him Satan at one point. He denies him three times. So Peter's the one that is the realistic picture of faith. That, like Lauren said, we'll be looking at this too, that why we would love to say that we do faith over fear, oftentimes we do fear over faith. And I've got the best of Peter types. So Peter's going to be the example on here. These stories are linked together. There's going to be four scenes, and these are the four scenes. And you're going to say, yeah, there's a lot here. Oh, by the way, we didn't sing, so it gives me 12 extra minutes. We're going to... Right? This is the pastor's dream. I get 12 extra minutes. Oh, we filled that in with some other stuff. All right. I'll keep it to the point. Four scenes. So John the Baptist being killed. We're going to look at that scene. That's going to lead into uh, the next, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, which is going to be an important formative experience for the disciples to prepare them for the next thing that's going to happen. And that's the walking on water. Where Jesus is walking uh, by, and they happen to see it, and they freak out, and well, we'll get into the story here a little bit with what happens there. And then um, that leads to getting to the other side, and Jesus healing uh, people again. And that's going to serve as kind of a bookend to um, this section that he is focusing on. Now again, like I've been doing in the past, uh, bit, here's, the, here's the key point. I'm just going to put that out here so you can see where things are going. Everything kind of revolves around this. Faith over fear trusts Jesus' character and confidence and responds to his calling. Okay, hopefully, most of what I say this morning is about that. And that's where I'm going with this. Faith over fear trusts Jesus' character and confidence and responds to his calling. Now, a couple things real quickly to bring in here. Uh, we spent a lot of time on it. This is a both and thing, right? This is what we just talked about with, with Lauren. Faith over fear is not an either or reality now as much as we would like it. It's a both and reality, right? We struggle with doubt and fear. Um, and that is the battle of faith that we engage with. Okay, when Paul says, um, fight the good fight of faith, it's really about fighting against doubt and, and fear. Okay? So, and again, when I'm thinking of faith, this is what I'm thinking about. This is what I think is a... a 30,000 foot summary of what faith is. We're going to see it on the ground or on the water here in a little bit. Faith is the freedom to do what Jesus is calling you to do. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way, but faith is the freedom to do what Jesus is calling you to do. All right, some pictures. I'm going to get you some visual um, grounding here where things are. I wish we had bigger screens because it's kind of hard to, to see with that. But at the very bottom is the Dead Sea. 
to the right of, of that, um, there's a little arrow saying north, pointing up. That's actually fairly close to where John the Baptist's story takes place. There was a, a, a fortress that was there uh, where Herod had, had built and where he had kept John the Baptist. That's where he was killed, so down by the Sea of Galilee, or excuse me, by the Dead Sea. Now, if you go all the way up that Jordan River Valley, um, you'll see another blue little dot up there before you get to the Mediterranean Sea. That's the Sea of Galilee. That's where the rest of the story takes place, the walking on the water, the, the healings that's happening, the feeding of the 5,000. That's where the story of there is happening. So news has to travel from down below to get up to there. So the next picture is actually the, the picture of the fortress that's left of it. It's on that hill there, looking over the Sea of Galilee toward Jerusalem. You can actually, now this picture didn't have it, you can actually see Jerusalem from there. Jerusalem could see that fortress. Uh, from there. But that's where John the Baptist was, was killed. Um, this next picture, as you know, um, Sharon and I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and we were on the Sea of Galilee, got to see that. So this is us walking down to the Sea of Galilee. This is Gennesar. In the reading, it's going to be called uh, Gennesaret. Uh, this is the last story, the fourth story, where Jesus lands with the disciples and he heals many. Right here. Uh, I just changed names over the last 2,000 years. Next picture. There's going to be a few pictures up. Just here's some. Uh, these are just pictures of the Sea of Galilee, uh, just to give you a, a picture of where the miracle took, took place. Some of those boats are kind of patterned after ancient boats. Uh, another picture of the sea is where we're about ready to get out of the boat. Next one. Um, we actually got on a boat, and we got out on the sea, and, uh, you know, Kevin, Dr. Kevin Adams was reading some passages that were relevant to it, which Matthew 14 was a relevant uh, passion, or passage for this Peter and Jesus walking on water right where we were kind of going, going through there. Um, this is a picture from the, from the bow of the boat. You the idea of just being out on the Sea of, of Galilee. Um, it be a little bit bigger than what you might think at that time, so. And of course, got a third picture of a beautiful life. <laughs> and then when you get to the other side, this is a, the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The whole, the whole story is seen as all off to the right, but the sun was setting over this way. All right, so all that in mind, um, let's take a look at chapter 14 and, and read God's Word. I invite you to follow along in your Bible, or the few Bibles, or up on the, on the screen. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him, put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. Wonderful lady. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. Wonderful guy. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there and abode to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need to go away, or they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. 
And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against him. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When he got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick, and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Heavenly Father, as we take a look at these words of yours penned many years ago, I pray that you would continue to do their work of forming us more into the image of your Son, Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen. Well, it was back on July 4th in 1845 that a young man took up a two-year, two-month, two-day experiment on life and spirituality. So this experiment involved him moving into a small little shack that he built in the woods by a pond called Walden that was owned by his friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson. In a book that he wrote about this experience about seven years later called Walden, or uh, Life in the Woods. Anybody know who this is? There you go. Thank you. You nailed it. Henry David Thoreau detailed uh, his time there and what this, this thing was really all about for him, this two-year, two-month, two-day experiment. There's a quote that comes from this book that's been a powerful quote for myself over the years about his approach to life. He went into the woods not looking to uh, get away from things, but actually to dive into things deeper. He wanted to experience things. He wanted to get away from the technologies that were available back in 1845. Like, really? There was that much of that time to get away from so that he could experience the fullness of the experience without being distracted. Like pumping water. It just comes out of a faucet. You don't experience the pumping of getting that water out yourself. He wanted to experience life, all of it. If it was cold, so be it. You feel the cold, that kind of thing. So he, he said this in this book. I did not wish to live what was not life. He recognized that living is so dear, it's precious. We've got one life to live. Nor did I wish to practice resignation, like give it up on life because there's hardness and difficulty in it unless it was quite necessary, meaning he was sick and ready to die. He said, I wanted to live deep and suck all the marrow out of life. Now, we love that phrase. He wanted to live deep and suck the marrow all out of life, out of all of his experiences. And of course, if you watch the movie Dead Poets Society, they make a big deal about this as, as well. Um, but this was Mar or a Thoreau's approach to life, to suck the marrow out of life. And I submit to you that this is the same thing that Paul calls us to when he says, make the most of every opportunity. And I submit to you that, that that's going to be a call, a life of faith, a life of radical abandon to Jesus Christ. A life, as we talked about before, of going all in for Jesus Christ, not being a fan, but a participant in God's unfolding divine drama as key players within 
this drama, of key actors and actresses within us putting on Christ as we move forward through this. So let's take a look at these, these four scenes, all right, and, and see what they tell us about faith, what we can learn about faith, and particularly faith over fear. And just a real quick note, this faith over fear has been used quite a bit out there. I don't see quite as much anymore with a lot that's going on with the pandemic and the protests and so forth. I encourage you as best as possible not to politicize faith, not to reduce it into some nationalistic kind of understanding, but to hold it in all its sacredness and holiness from Scripture, which doesn't bring it into a politicized kind of way other than how we live that out as image bearers of Christ, seeking to love God and love one another. All right, so first scene, John the Baptist. All right, crazy scene going on there. John's in prison, right? He's been in prison through Jesus's ministry, so he's not seen what Jesus has been doing. He's been holed up there for at least a year and a half, probably up to close to two years at this uh, point. Um, Herod wants to kill him, but he fears the people because they think he's a prophet. Herod's run by fear, right? That's how he operates. Um, he goes on a trip down the Mediterranean, and he runs into his brother's wife at some retreat place, and they become infatuated with one another. Long story short, they both decide to get divorced from their current spouses and get married themselves. And John the Baptist saying, this is crazy. This is not what God ordained marriage to be. You may be civilly divorced by the state, but you are married in God's eyes. This is wrong. And Herod and Herodias did not like being called out by John the Baptist, which is why he got thrown into prison. And when Herodias is furious with him, even um, up until this, this time. So a party happens. It's a birthday party. They're celebrating. His niece um, dances. He likes it. He promises her anything she wants. Mom steps in as an opportunity. Wait a minute. Anything? Anything. Okay, kill John the Baptist. He ends up killing him. John is dead. Faith over fear. John had faith in Jesus of Nazareth. He called one of the leading authorities in the area out according to God's word. And it didn't quite go the way that you and I would hope that it would go. He landed him in prison and got his head cut off. Okay, reality check here. This is tying in last week's message of rejection. That the gospel is often rejected. Jesus is often rejected. It's, it's part and parcel of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So this sets the stage for what's going on. The rejection of John the Baptist as a rejection of faith in God or faith in, in Jesus. So the news travels all the way to Jordan Valley. Right, takes a while to get up there. Jesus hears the news. He mourns, right? This is his cousin that just got killed. John the Baptist, the one that, that paved the way for him. The great prophet is dead. Jesus mourns. He's shook by this, so he goes out on a boat. Well, people know that Jesus is in the neighborhood, and they find him and track him down, and they start crowding around the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus sees them. Now he's mourning. He's in solitude. He wants to be alone. And a giant crowd comes. What do you and I do? I don't know about you. I push further out into the sea. <laughs> Most likely, to be honest. But Jesus, as hard as compassion, pursuing kingdom purposes, he goes ashore and he heals the people there. And this is the beginning of scene number two. He heals the people there. And toward the end of the day, the sun setting, the disciples are like, look, we got up to 10,000 people here. Man, 10,000 people. So you got 5,000 men that they counted, plus the wives and the children. So lots of people here. They're like, man, hangry start to set in here. People are getting hungry. Yeah, they've been healed. Some of this joy, but and this is not going to be looking pretty here, though, because we don't have food. We need to, Jesus send them away to the villages where they came from so they can get something to, to eat. Jesus says, no, we don't need to send them away. You, you feed them. They're like, what? <laughs> With what? 
We have five loaves and two fish, and there's like 10,000 people here. So Jesus says, bring it. He doesn't quite, just bring it here, bring it here. And he prays, he blesses, not the food, he blesses God for who he is. And he says, serve, and go out and serve. All those people. And a miracle happens, right? And then there's 12 baskets left over in the scraps. And so what Jesus is doing here, He's showing the disciples his character and his confidence. He's compassionate, and he's a God of abundance. A God of abundance. This is meant clearly to say, Jesus doesn't do things half-heartedly. He's all in. He didn't do just enough to feed everybody. He says, look, there's more than enough. They were satisfied. They ate till they couldn't eat no more, and there were 12 baskets left over. Jesus was forming their faith if they were paying attention. He was forming their faith, all right? So Jesus does end up dismissing them from there. And again, he goes up in solitude to continue his mourning. Uh, disciples are out on the boat, all right? So here's the question that is going on here. You see on the screen here some of the things that are, that, that are being challenged right now. Jesus is forming their faith, but what's challenging that faith? What might be the fear? on that scenario, or in that scenario. And you see it right here, the fear of scarcity, we don't have enough, we can't do this. Fear of inadequacy, I, I can't do this. We can't do this. You're calling us to do the impossible. It's not possible. And Jesus said, yep, it's exactly right. I call you to do impossible things in and through yourself. Trust me. Trust my character. Trust my confidence. Get over your fear of scarcity. Get over your fear of inadequacy. Trust me. All right, so that's the first, that's a scene number two there that's forming their faith. This leads the disciples out onto the boat. They're going to cross over as Jesus has said. So they're on the boat. A storm arises and it beats against the boat. Now, the, the word beat means torment. It's just like the, the sea is punishing them and just beat mercy, mercy, mercilessly against them. We're going to be in scene three right now. And the disciples are out on the boat and they're starting to fear for the life. Now, they're out there for nine hours, okay? It's three in the morning, the fourth watch of the night, three in the morning when Jesus comes walking out. Now, Again, in his providence, his understanding, he decides at 3 in the morning, for whatever reason, he's going to just go cruising over to the other side. Now, there's some allusions here in Mark and in the other um, uh, Gospels that said he was going to pass them by. That was his intention to pass them by. Now, if you know your Old Testament, when God wanted to show himself to somebody, what would he do? He would pass them by. It was a theophany. Go on. Jesus was planning to show himself to the disciples that I am God, I am divine. He was going to further form their faith. His intention was to pass by to show him who he was. So he walks out there. But it's dark. It's three minutes. The darkest part of the night. They're out on the Sea of Galilee. The storm is raging. They're tired. And Jesus comes walking by. And they don't recognize him. They think it's a ghost. Rightfully so. I'd be thinking the same thing. No one walks in water. This is nuts. And they freak out. They're terrified. And Jesus, in his compassion, says, take heart inside. Now, test. Have they been formed properly by Christ? Have they been listening? Have they been paying attention? Jesus just told them, take heart inside. Who listens? Well, we know Peter listens for sure. Peter, in his impulsiveness, um, responds immediately to Jesus. If that's you, Lord, you call me out. Okay, this is very, very important. He doesn't just jump off the edge of the boat and say, Jesus, please bless this walk. Please bless me as I go to you, as I get out of the boat. He said, if that's you, call me. To you, command me to come to you. And Jesus just says, Come. 
So, so Peter's responding. Faith responds to the call of Jesus. It's not impulsive. And we do this all the time. Myself included. We, we get out and we go do something and say, God, please bless this. Please bless this endeavor. I've already decided I'm going to go do this. Please bless this. Please bless this job that I chose to take and I never even consulted you on it. Please bless this marriage that I decided to go into and never really consulted you on it. Please bless whatever it is. And it's retro. It's taking a step and then telling God and asking God to bless that. That's not faith. It's the opposite of faith. You are being Lord here. You're telling God what to do. And it's crassness and harshness here. Peter's showing, it's like, no, faith focuses on Jesus and waits for him to call. And at the call of Jesus, then Peter gets out of the boat. Only then he gets out of the boat. So what we start to get here is Peter understanding who Jesus is, being informed correctly that he might be able to respond in some way. Now the question becomes here, what boat is Jesus calling you to get out of? What boat are you stuck in? Uh, John Herbert, if you, if you want to read more on this, he wrote a great book almost two decades ago. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. Wonderful book. I was shocked when I was reading through this, how much this book formed me, my understanding of, of, of faith as I went back through it. But he calls the other 11 disciples boat potatoes. <laughs> you know, like couch potatoes being lazy and, and just sit back in the comfort of the boat in the sea. And boat potatoes. Some of us might be boat potatoes. And that God might be calling us out of that boat. And what is that boat? Comfort? Complacency? The status quo? The way it's always been? Security? Individualism? Politics? Anything can be a boat. That can keep us from stepping out in faith. Again, we're caught where God, where Jesus has called us to step out uh, in, in faith. That's one of the questions to wrestle with. Now, this, this church has been great about stepping out of the boat. You guys have demonstrated this over and over again, individually, collectively, as the body of Christ. You know what it means to step out of the boat. It's just that sometimes we get tired of it because we forget the exhilaration and joy of that adventure. We get distracted, which is what's going to happen here in just a few moments. So Peter is out there. He's walking on water. You, you've got to, there's exhilaration, there's joy that he's doing something that's impossible, that only God can do in and through. He can't do this on his own. And he's looking at Jesus, he's walking to Jesus, he's walking on water. And what happens? He's focusing on Jesus, he's walking on water, he's doing the impossible, he's feeling pretty good, and he looks around. <laughs> He's like, whoa, hey, wait a minute. He sees the wind. He can't see wind. So he saw the effects of the wind. He saw the waves um, lapping up near him. I, I can't really picture this with the big waves and how they weren't knocking. I, I just can't picture this. I don't know. I don't even know what this looks like, to be honest with you. But he sees the waves, and they're blowing. He's soaking wet. He's probably cold. It's 3 in the morning. And he's like, I can't be walking on water. <laughs> People don't walk on water. This is nuts -o. This is crazy. What am I doing out here? And he begins sinking immediately. He takes his eyes off Jesus. He sees what's around him. So this is not possible. And he begins to sink. Fear over faith will sink you. Will drown you. Will take you out of the game. Will take you out of your participation. We start looking around, we see the circumstances we find ourselves in. We see the storms, we see the difficulties, we see the problems, like, I can't do this. We can't do this. This is hopeless. And Jesus said, yep. If you want to bank on you and your resources on your own, it is hopeless. You're absolutely right. You need to bank on me. You need to bank on my character and my confidence. If I've called you to do it, it will happen. Now, it may not happen the way that you think it's going to happen or where it's going to go 
And Tim and I, we had dreams and plans about River Rock, not even close. But we got out of the boat and we planted River Rock. And it was exhilarating and a joy. And we got distracted probably many times with that. And we needed to refocus on Jesus and keep us focused on what we were doing there. What wind is distracting you from walking on water? You, you might be walking on the water right now. You got out of the boat, but you're distracted. You got your eye off Jesus now. What is it for you that might have taken your eye off Jesus? That's one of the key questions to ask about this. But what's the solution to this? Well, obviously, turn your eyes back to Jesus. Right? You turn back to Jesus. And that's what he does. He recognizes he's sinking, he's going down, and he turns to Jesus to help me, save me. And Jesus, what, immediately grabs him, pulls him. Which, by the way, unless Jesus has super long arms, which he might just go and grab him, it means that Peter walked all the way to him. And he's probably right here. He's like, whoa, this is so cool. He starts looking around. He's like, oh. And that's when he goes in, and Jesus just grabs him. Jesus calls you to do something. He's not going to abandon you. He's there for you. He is for us, for you, and for his world. We're going to turn to Jesus. He says two things to him. Kind of hard, harsh, I think. This is the wisdom of the words of Jesus. So, back real quickly. Peter heard and was formed by the character and confidence of Jesus to such a degree that he was able to recognize the situation for what it was and say, it's way better for me to be with Jesus out on that storm than it is to be in this boat with these 11 other people. I'd rather be with Jesus. And so that faith formed him in such a way that he was able to act in a way that was faithful and move toward Jesus. Now, taking his eyes off, Fear crept in and he began to sing. So he turns back to Jesus. He grabs him, saves him. And then Jesus says this to him. Oh, ye of little faith. Dude, I just walked on water. <laughs> like, no, I made you walk on water. And he says, you have little faith. Oligo pisto, little faith. A little bit of fear undermines a lot of faith. But that little faith that he had got him out of the boat. Faith of a mustard seed. It was more faith than the other love it had. For Peter to, to be able to, to do this. Oh, you have little faith. And then catch this here. This is the root of his fear. He said, why did you doubt? And Jesus said, why did you doubt? So when Peter took his eyes off Jesus, he began to doubt the situation. And that's what happens in life when fear takes over in place of faith. This fear, the root of it is doubt. I've had plain images in my head all the time here, so Michael, thank you for this. If I don't think Michael is, his character and his confidence is great, he's formed it in such a way that I should not trust him as a human being, which he hasn't. And he invites me to go flying with him. What do you think is going to happen if I doubt his character and his confidence. I will fear flying with him. And I will not do it, most likely. That's what fear does. That's what doubt does. But I know my, I know his character and his confidence. And I can have confidence and trust and faith that he's a great pilot. And so I don't doubt and I don't have fear. And guess what? I get to go flying. I get to go up where we're not supposed to be and see things from a different perspective. And that's the walking on the water. Jesus will take you places you'll never believe and do experiences that you never think have. That doesn't mean going to the ends of the earth. That, just, that means having experiences and uh, relationships and, and uh, ways of, of interacting with God and with each other in ways that you would have never experienced before. If you didn't trust him, if you didn't step out of your boat, if you didn't get too comfortable, if we didn't get so comfortable in complacency, if we didn't get so comfortable with comfort or security, 
He decided to listen and step out and walk in faith. Doubt destroys faith. Now, some people want us, want us to embrace doubt. Now, what they're trying to do, I think, the best is like, you know, this is this bold end. We don't want to have doubt and fear. But don't embrace it. We want to fight it. We fight it by faith. We do that imperfectly. We struggle. We have fits about this. We take three steps forward, two steps back. But don't embrace doubt and fear. We embrace Jesus and faith. Okay, what does this lead to? Landing the plane here pretty quick. Faith over fear leads to worship. What happens? They get in the boat. The, the storm calms down and they're like, whoa, you really are the Son of God, Jesus. And they worship. Faith over fear leads to worship. When we lead faithful lives to the obedience and calling of Jesus into our life, it leads to glorifying God, glorifying Jesus, magnifying Him for who and what He is. The book ends with this whole thing is that they land on shore where they're intending to go and they go out and they go into the towns and they bring all the people to Him and Jesus heals. And the word there for heal is sozo. And sozo means to save. It's the word for salvation. He saves them. Now, in this case, it's probably physical and mental saving, but it alludes to Jesus as a Savior and that He's the one that saves it. In Him, we find our salvation. In Him, we find our freedom. In Him, we find our ability to walk by faith to wherever He calls us. You know, so, may we walk by faith and not sight. And the not, the not sight is not the sight of the things of the world. It's the seeing and looking at Jesus of Nazareth. In Him, we place our trust for His character and His confidence to lead us wherever He wants to lead us. And we get the joy and the exhilaration and being on that journey with Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this amazing stories uh, about the forming of Your disciples' faith so that they might act in ways that worship and glorify You. As You take us to places that on our own we cannot do so that we have no right to glorify or magnify ourselves. That you are the only one that deserves the praise and honor and glory for that. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see what boats that we might be stuck in. And we would ask you to call us forward and that we listen to that. And if it's a yes to come out of the boat, a yes to move forward, that we would have the courage 